this morning the language of Ashdod. The language of Ashdod. And for those who are not familiar with that little phrase, let's open up to Nehemiah, chapter 13, the book of Nehemiah. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, <coughs> Nehemiah chapter 13. And the passage we're about to read from has to do with after the return from captivity, Babylonian captivity. Let's read in uh, Nehemiah 13, verse, <coughs> verse 23. In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As for their children, half spoke the language of Ashdod, and there's the title for our lesson this morning, Half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So I contended with them, and cursed them, and struck some of them, and pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons or for your servants. If you've got the New International Version this morning, <coughs> verse 24 will say, Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. So their children, you see, uh, half of their children spoke the language of the language of Ashdod, or some other language, and they didn't know the language of Judah. And this scripture is a much used scripture down through the uh, the years, the decades in the in the church, uh, as a, a scripture to remind us that when we speak we should be using pure speech. We should be speaking as the Bible speaks and not making up our own definitions of uh, Bible words and Bible concepts. And so I've entitled the lesson this morning, The Language of Ashdod, so that we might be encouraged to use pure speech and to call Bible things by Bible names. <coughs> now some of us, I know, are reading books by human authors, uh, and some of these are denominational orders, uh, authors. I think Ray Comfort seems to be the flavour of the month. But of course, when you read such books, uh, you can be, uh, if you're not careful, you can be tempted to start speaking the way that they speak. And so, if you'll turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if we are going to read such uh, literature, then we should remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. <coughs> Examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. So if we are going to read such uh, literature, make sure we're discerning. Examine it carefully, but hold fast to what is good, and reject what is evil. <coughs> In fact, if you think about it, we should make sure that we're reading the Bible more than we're reading books by human authors. This book is written by God, ultimately through His Spirit. And we should be reading the Scriptures more than we should be reading human authors. In John chapter 12, verse 48, uh, let's turn there. I think we sang this uh, verse earlier this morning, but let's read it again. John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. So on that last day, when we stand before Jesus, Jesus is not going to hold up a copy of Ray Comfort's book and say, I'm about to judge you by Ray Comfort's book. No, this is the scriptures. Uh, these are the, this is the word that we'll be judged by, the word that Jesus spoke. And so we should be putting more time into this than any human authors. But if we do read human authors, and there's nothing wrong with that at times, make sure we're discerning. <coughs> Others of us uh, may have come out over the years from various denominations, Anglican, Catholic, Pentecostal, whatever. And some of us might have brought baggage over, language that they used, that we need to re-examine and reconsider so that we change the way we speak and we don't speak the language of Ashdod. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, the encouragement is very clear that we should be speaking as the Bible speaks. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. We're told here, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. So an encouragement in the Old Testament to speak according to the word of God and not anything different to the word of God. In 
1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Paul wrote, uh, <clears throat> that you may learn in us not to exceed what is written. Don't go beyond what is written. Hold fast to what is written. And I'm sure you'll remember 1 Peter 4 verse 11. If anyone speaks, speak as it were the utterances of God. So we've got plenty of encouragements in the Word of God not to use the language of Ashdod, so to speak, not to use denominational language or any other worldly language, but to call Bible things by Bible names. <clears throat> and so this morning I'd like us to have a look at three examples of the language of Ashdod so that we might uh, change our way of speaking or uh, be aware that we should not speak in these ways. And the first of these is a very popular saying in the denominations that people are witnessing for Jesus. I don't know whether you've heard that, but uh, I've certainly heard and read it many times that people claim that they are witnesses today for Jesus. But as we examine the scriptures today, we'll see that this is really the language of Ashdod. It's not the language of the Bible. It's uh, denominational speak, and we shouldn't be speaking the same way. <coughs> A witness uh, is not someone who tells you what they think or they feel. A witness is not someone who tells you what someone else told them about some particular event. If you were called into the, uh, the courts of our land as a witness to some event, and you said, well look, I wasn't there, but I feel or I think this is about it, or someone told me this about it, it wouldn't last too long as a witness, you'd be bundled out and they'd get a proper witness. Even the Macquarie Dictionary says that a witness is someone who has been present, who has personally seen or perceived a thing, a beholder, a spectator, an eyewitness. And not only does the Macquarie Dictionary say that, but the Scriptures also say the same thing. Let's open up to uh, Matthew chapter 18 as one example. <coughs> Matthew 18 verse 15, this is one example of many we can look at. If your brother sins, <coughs> go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So witnesses, you see, were those people who were present to see and to hear what took place between the two brethren. That's what a witness was. And notice as it goes on to say there, witnesses then could confirm what was going on. They could go back to the church if necessary, if the brother didn't repent or the sister didn't repent, and they could go back and report to the church the facts of the matter. That's what a, scripture, uh, that's what a witness means in the scriptures. Well, let's take it one step further. Let's think about God's witnesses. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Remember Judas uh, committed suicide, betrayed Jesus, and they were seeking to replace Judas. Acts chapter 1 verse 21. It is necessary that of the men who have, been, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that Jesus was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So not everybody in that first century could be a witness of the resurrection. They had to be someone who'd been with Jesus during his ministry for those years and seen him risen from the dead if they were going to qualify as a witness of Jesus. If we cross over to Acts chapter 10, when Peter talks more about this, Acts chapter 10, verse, uh, let's read from verse 39 onwards. <coughs> Acts chapter 10, verse 39. Peter says, we are witnesses, there it is again, of all the things that he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Not to all the people. Now, highlight that in your mind. Not everyone, even in those days, could be a witness. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered 
us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Not all people can be witnesses for God, you see, witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Even in the first century, not all people could be witnesses of the resurrection. <coughs> and given these requirements, given these requirements that we just read about, we see that no one can die, no one is alive today can ever possibly hope to be a witness for Jesus. And so to use this kind of language today that we're witnessing for Jesus is the language of Ashdod. It's not the language of the Bible. It's not the teaching of the Scriptures. And we shouldn't use that kind of uh, terminology today. The Apostles were God's chosen witnesses of the resurrection. Uh, <coughs> today... As we talk about the language of Ashdod, you might, have hear, you might hear of the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses. Now there again is the language of Ashdod. There's no such thing as witnesses today that meet the requirements we've just read about in the passages. So Jehovah's Witnesses is again the language of Ashdod. The only witness that we have today for the resurrection of Jesus is right here before us in the New Testament. It's valid. It's our... Uh, our proof for the resurrection of Jesus and we can't find to be witnesses to him today. We can tell other people about the witness that is preserved for us in the scriptures but we are not the witnesses who saw Jesus risen from the dead and who spent three years or so with him in his ministry. And so let's not use the language of Ashton. Let's not say that we're going to witness for Jesus today. Let's not say that we're going to give a testimony for Jesus today because a testimony is just another way of saying a witness. Let's remember that this is not Bible talk, but this is the language of Ashdod. A second one I'd like us to think about this morning for the language of, language of Ashdod is concerning the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Denominationalism has greatly confused people about the way the Holy Spirit operates. Many people today are saying things like this that the Holy Spirit guides people apart from the Word of God. And so a common teaching we'll find in denominational circles today is that for someone to be converted, the Holy Spirit personally and directly and miraculously works on that person and converts them, even if they don't want to be converted or even if they're ignorant of what's in the Scriptures. Now that's some of the teaching that's floating around in the world today, the language of Ashdod. Other people are teaching that the Holy Spirit is a bit like an inner light that glows in us and guides us separate to what the Word says, and sometimes even contradictory to what the Word says. Again, this is the language of Ashdod. And even among ourselves, I've heard at different times, people say things where you've got to say, did I hear that correctly? where people were almost uh, trying to say things about the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I, should, I should rephrase that. It sounds as if people are saying things about the Holy Spirit where even they're confused about how the Holy Spirit guides us today, as if it's some kind of direct guidance from the Spirit without uh, the Word of God. And so I thought we'd today have a look at uh, how the Holy Spirit does guide us. Let's go back to the Old Testament first of all. Let's go back to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9. A lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit today, but let's stay within the Word of God. <coughs> In Nehemiah 9, verse 30, we read here, However, you bore with them for many years, talking about God, of course, bearing with His people, and admonished them by your Spirit. Now notice this, this is the Holy Spirit admonishing the people. Now, the next three words, I want you to highlight in your brain and remember them. You admonish them by your spirit through your prophets. That's how the spirit guided them. That's how the spirit admonished them. That's how the, uh, the spirit taught the people was through the inspired prophets of God. The Holy Spirit, you see, wasn't some kind of inner light in the Old Testament guiding God's people separate to the inspired message that God had delivered to them. It was through your prophets that the Holy Spirit was admonishing. 
And let's go across to the New Testament to see the same thing. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, I'm sure we all know this verse very well, but we need to appreciate what it's saying. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is, what's the sword of the Spirit? Some inner light that guides us, separate to God's Word? Some direct operation upon us miraculously, contrary to what we really want and contrary to God's Word? No. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. There it is again. That's how the Holy Spirit is going to guide us and influence us through the Word. And I'd like you this morning to think about the command in Ephesians 5 verse 18. Now I've got that command here so uh, there's no need for you to turn it up uh, at the moment. But uh, I'm not sure how can I do this with see Here's the command in Ephesians 5 verse 18. Do not uh, be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in songs in spiritual songs, and singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now I've got a question for us all this morning. This here, be filled with the Spirit, is a command of God. We can't ignore that any more than we ignore any other command of God. So I ask you this morning. This command of God, how are you obeying that command? How are you being filled with oops, sorry, how are you being filled with the Spirit this morning? Well, fortunately for us, Paul also wrote about the same time, in the context of the same topic of singing, wrote this in Colossians. So I put these two passages together. Whereas in Ephesians he says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in Psalms and hymns. In Colossians he says. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and promising one another with songs in the spiritual songs, and so on. Can you see the parallel between the two here? If we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we need to have the sword of the Spirit inside us, dwelling within us. And that doesn't happen miraculously. 2, Peter, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, we need to study the word, show ourselves approved as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. That's how we can obey this command, you see, to be filled with the Spirit, is to make sure that we let the Word of Christ richly dwell within us. <clears throat> and so, on this point here of uh, this language of Ashdod about people saying that the Holy Spirit can guide us apart from the Word of God, I'd like to give you four examples of the way that the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God. And the first of these four is in enlightenment. Now people are talking a lot about being enlightened and being enlightened by God. But we'll see that to be enlightened by God doesn't mean the Holy Spirit somehow miraculously operating on a separate to God's Word or being some kind of inner light inside us separate to God's Word. If you'll turn with me back to Psalm 19. How does God enlighten us? Psalm 19 verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There it is. How does God enlighten our eyes? By the commandment of the Lord. By the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't act apart from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, enlightens us. In Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to, to my feet and a light to my path. God's word shows us how to go. That's the Holy Spirit showing us how to go. And what about us when we pray to God for understanding of God's word? Should we be praying to God that somehow the Holy Spirit is going to do separate to God's word, guide us into some kind of knowledge and understanding of what God wants? No. Turn with me while we're in Psalms to Psalm 119, verse 18. <coughs> Psalm 119, verse 18. Now notice this. The psalmist says to God, Open my eyes, that I might behold wonderful things. 
Now, a lot of people who pray something like this to God today stop there. They say, God, open my eyes. Let the Holy Spirit guide me into what you want. And they stop there. But look at the end of the verse. Look at it again. Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. That's the guidance that, uh, and the, the prayer that we pray to God. Help us to see what the Holy Spirit has already given us in your word. Not that the Holy Spirit somehow is going to guide us separate to the word of God. But help us to see what's in there. Help us to better understand it. I always remember when I look at this verse here. Uh, remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Where Jesus came and talked to them after his resurrection. And he explained the scriptures to them. And can you remember what they said later on? Our hearts burned within us as he was explaining the scriptures to them. They saw it. They understood it. They knew what the prophecies were saying about the coming Christ and his resurrection. And their hearts burned within them. The Holy Spirit, you see, is not going to give us guidance apart from God's word. But when we better understand God's word, we can see the wonderful things that are in here. And that's what we should be praying to God. Not some kind of nebulous prayer to God that the Holy Spirit might guide us into all the truth, which was a promise to the apostles, not a promise to us today. But uh, as the psalmist has said, let's ask God that he might give us, say, uh, Psalm 119 and 108, uh, verse 18, that he might open our eyes and we can see wonderful things from your law, from your word, from the scriptures. So there's one way the Holy Spirit guides us today, through the word, in enlightenment. The second way we can have a look at is in conversion. Now, I don't know how we're going for time today, but uh, perhaps we won't look all of these up. But uh, if I said to you, and you should know the answer to this, if I said to you today, where does faith come from? Is it going to be some kind of miraculous intervention by the Holy Spirit who opens up our hearts to receive? No, baloney. Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes from hearing... And hearing the word of Christ. There it is. The word of Christ, which is the sword of the Spirit. That's how people come to faith, uh, to faith today. Romans 1 verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation. That's how people are saved through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. Paul says, he called you miraculously through the Holy Spirit, separate to the word of God. No. He called you, writes Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, through our gospel. Through the inspired message, you see, is the way that people are called, is the way that people come to faith, is the way that people are saved. That's how the Holy Spirit works in conversion. So we've seen the Holy Spirit in enlightenment, we've seen the Holy Spirit in conversion through the word of God. Let's now go thirdly to sanctification. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That's how people are sanctified, you see, are set apart to God who know the right way to walk, is by following God's word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness that the man of God might be adequate. If we want to be sanctified, if we want to know what God requires of us, if we want to be adequate and perfect before God, then it's the scriptures that we go to, the sword of the Spirit. We don't speak the language of Ashdod and say, well, somehow the Holy Spirit's going to guide us separate to God's word. That's the language of Ashdod. That's the language of denominations. We don't speak that. We speak what's in God's word. Bible names and Bible descriptions for Bible things. <clears throat> what's amazing, I think, is if you want to know what the Spirit is going to say to the churches... All you've got to do is go to the book of Revelation. Because you might remember that many, many times in the book of Revelation, seven in fact, in the first couple of chapters, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the way the Spirit's speaking to the churches, you see, through God's Word that he inspired, the sword of the Spirit. And if we as a church today want to know how we should be living and acting, well, first of all, let's go through Revelation 2 and 3 very carefully, because that's the word of the Spirit to the churches. And then let's go through the rest of the New Testament and, uh, and listen to the Spirit's word. <clears throat> and so uh, there's the third way. Uh, in sanctification, the Spirit guides us uh, through the word. The fourth way is in salvation. Let's turn to James chapter 1. In 
James chapter 1 verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted. Now notice this, which is able to save your souls. So the word, you see, can save us into eternity. Even as Christians, you see, this is written to Christians. This word implanted, if you take this word, the sword of the Spirit, then uh, it is able to save our souls for all eternity. <clears throat> and so many today are speaking the language of Ashtoth telling us that the Holy Spirit guides us apart from the Word of God. But that, that's all it is. That's just the language of Ashdod. And if we're going to speak pure speech and speak as the Bible speaks today, then we shouldn't be talking like that. Let's make sure that we talk as the way the Scriptures do and uh, teach the way the Scriptures teach. Well, the final one for this morning, the final language of Ashdod, is this one here. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about Christians in denominations. Christians in denominations. A lot of people have got this idea that there are faithful Christians, faithful Christians, Mark, scattered among the denominations. Uh, the denominational view is that the church is some kind of mystical collection of all believers who are scattered throughout all the denominations. That's what the church, uh, sorry, that's what the denominations think that the church is, some kind of mystical collection of all kinds of believers, of different beliefs, from all the different congregations, make up the church of Jesus. Well, I hope you'll realise this morning that to say that there are faithful Christians among the various denominations is the language of Ashdod. It's not the language of the Scriptures. We are running out of time this morning, so we don't have time to go through all of the errors that are associated with denominationalism. Perhaps I can mention a few just to revive your memory. The denominations teach error on sin and salvation. They say babies have borne the sin of Adam. They say that once saved, you're always saved. Denominations teach error on how to become a Christian. Many say you only need to have faith alone. You don't need to repent and be baptised. Many denominations uh, teach error in their human creeds and their human names. Lutheran, Baptist, Anglican, Catholic. Where do you find any of those names anywhere in the scriptures? I heard a fellow uh, say the other day that uh, the Baptists are actually in the scriptures because John was the first one in the Baptist church. I mean, people will twist the scriptures any way they can, I guess, but uh, there's no Baptist church mentioned in the scriptures. There's no Catholic angle, and so on. These are errors that men have made. Uh, the organisation of the church among denominations is in error. Instead of having uh, an eldership when men are qualified in plurality to be parts of the eldership and deacons and so on, they have things like archdeacons and archbishops and, and popes and whatever else uh, you want to talk about. The worship of the church has been corrupted. All kinds of addition to worship, instrumental music and so on. The work of the church has been corrupted. And so I could go on and on and on. Many, many errors associated with denominationalism. But the point of all of this is that Jesus doesn't tolerate such error. Let's turn to Romans 16. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 16 verse 17. Paul writes, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances <coughs> contrary to the teaching which you learn. So here are the errors. This is contrary teaching to what's in the Scriptures. Uh, contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. Turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Can you describe those people as Christians, as faithful Christians, if they're not slaves of Jesus, but of their own appetites? Well, that's what they're doing, you see, if they're turning people away from the true teaching. And that's what denominations are doing. They've got corrupt uh, uh, ideas about sin and salvation, about what's required to become a Christian, about the names of the church, about the organisation of the church, the work of the church, the worship of the and so on. These have turned away from the teaching. And uh, Paul says here, turn away from them. 
They're not a part, you see, of those who are going to be saved by Jesus if they remain in those errors. This is the language of Ashdod to say that there are faithful Christians in denominations. There might be people who were once Christians and who've fallen away from the church and have gone back into denominationalism. That might take place. But there's no such thing as faithful Christians who are in and among denominations and worshipping good people. <clears throat> in 2 John 1 verse 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. You can't get words any plainer. You've got to stay within this teaching of the Spirit. You've got to follow the teaching of the Scripture if you're going to have God. And if you don't do this, you don't have God. And if you don't have God, you can't be a Christian. You can't be a faithful follower of Jesus. A lot of people today are saying that we should be tolerant. But tolerant is just an excuse for uh, accepting error. In Revelation chapter 2, what did Jesus say about tolerance? In Revelation chapter 2 verse 20, he writes to the church here, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that they can be acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I'll throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. So Jesus said, look, don't tolerate this. Don't put up with this woman Jezebel who claims to be a prophetess, but she's leading everyone astray. Don't tolerate it. Don't put up with it. And furthermore, he says, I gave her time to repent. Jesus is compassionate. He wants everyone to be saved. He gave this person time, but she refused to repent. She didn't want to change her ways. And so if, uh, uh, if people are going to stay with her, you see, all of them would be thrown into great tribulation unless they repented of her deeds. You see, it's denominational speak. It's the language, language of Ashdod to suggest that there are faithful Christians in fellowship with error and worshipping with error in denominations. Let's go to the book of Ephesians because uh, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again because so many people in the world are mixed up about it. Let's remember these three passages from the book of Ephesians. Some people say to you, well, look, look Al, uh, all you're trying to do is to get me to leave my denomination and come across to your denomination. What makes you think you're right and we're wrong? That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying here is in these three passages, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the church is the body of Christ. There's the first passage. The second passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is only one body or one church. And Ephesians chapter 5 is the third passage, verse 3, Jesus is the saviour of the body, or the saviour of the church. There's only one church, or one body. Jesus is the saviour of that body, and that's the body that we need to be a part of. When we're urging people to leave denominationalism and come across to the church, we're not urging them to come across to our denomination, the so-called Church of Christ denomination. We're urging them to leave all error and come across to the truth of God's word, and come across to the one body, the one church, that Jesus is the Saviour of. That's what we should be teaching people. Now I know uh, <clears throat> in the world today we have Baptist and Anglican and Catholic and Jehovah's Witnesses and so on. Where were they in the first century? Where were they on the day of Pentecost when people ba were baptised and were added to the same? They weren't there. And they shouldn't be here today. If we're going to be added to the church, we don't need to be added to anything like that. And if we're a part of that, we should come out of it. And, uh, and be a part of Jesus' church. Now, <clears throat> when I say this, uh, that there are no faithful Christians in denominations, I'm absolutely sure that there are many, many more Christians today in this world that we've got no idea at all about. Remember, Elijah was told when he thought he was the only one that was left, he was told that there were 7,000 men who have not found the need of Baal. Romans 11 verses 3 and 4. So I'm convinced that there are many, many, hundreds and thousands of Christians throughout this world that we don't know about, but the point here, of course, is that they're not worshipping faithfully in the nominations. They can't be fellowshipping error and fellowshipping Christ at the same time. 
And so uh, let's take that, yes, there is uh, the church in the world today, and there are Christians scattered throughout the world. We don't know all of them. We don't know many of them, perhaps. But uh, they're certainly not found in denominations. To say that uh, we have faithful Christians among the denominations is to use the language of Ashdod. It's not to call Bible things by Bible names. And so, uh, in conclusion this morning, uh, let's go back to our heading for the day. The language of Ashdod. The people back in Nehemiah's day wanted to have purified speech, to speak fewer words, and we should want the same today, to describe Bible things in terms of Bible words. Some of us might be reading denominational books. Let's examine them carefully, not the influence of either. Some of us might have come out of denominationalism. Well, that's great. But let's not carry the baggage with us. Let's look again at the New Testament and speak as the New Testament speaks. Let's make sure that we don't talk today about witnessing to Jesus. And we don't suggest that somehow the Holy Spirit guides us apart from the Word of God. Or we don't give people the impression that there are faithful Christians uh, scattered among the denominations. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Let's make sure that we're reading our Bibles more than we're reading any human books. Books by human authors. This is the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. This is what we're going to be judged by on the last day. So we should read and understand. I don't know if you remember back to your high school days when you had tests and exams coming up. Wouldn't it be great before the exam if the examiner said to you, I'm going to give you what's on the exam? Well, hasn't God done that to us? He's told us about a day of judgment that's coming up, but what has He given us? He's given us what's going to be on the day of judgment, what's going to be on the exam. All we've got to do is make sure now we comply with it. Couldn't get things any easier. Jesus' load is easy and His burden is light. We've got what we need. And it's as simple as Travis said in his supper talk. The commandments of God are not burdensome. 1 John 5 verse 3. All we've got to do is hear and obey. <coughs> not about talking the language of Ashdod, but talking about things in Bible ways. Bible names for Bible things. This morning uh, we extend the invitation to any who haven't yet come, become Christians. Don't listen to denominations. Listen to the word of God. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptised will be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. We urge you to do that to become a Christian today, to become saved. If we've already become saved, but then we've fallen back into the world. Perhaps we've fallen back into a denominational way of thinking or denominations. Come out of it. While we still have time, repent and pray to God for forgiveness. And for those of us who are in the church and who are remaining faithful, let's encourage each other to remain faithful until death. And to call Bible things by Bible names and not to use the language of Ashdod. Let's now sing our last song.